welcome to My Favorite Mystic, a podcast about the weird and wonderful world of mysticism. I'm AJ Langley, and today I'm joined by John Arblaster. He's assistant professor in the history of spirituality in the Low Countries at the Roosbrook Institute, University of Antwerp, an extraordinary visiting professor at the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies, KU Leuven. John, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I love the podcast. Thank you. That's so nice of you to say. So today you're here to speak about Jan van Roosbrook. But before we talk about him, let's talk about you. How did you become interested in the academic world of mysticism? Well, there's a long story and a short story, I guess. But basically, I started as a theology student in my second year uh, studying theology. I knew nothing about mysticism. I'd never heard about what mystical literature was, what mystical theology was. I didn't know the names of any mystics. And in my second year of the BA program in theology in Leuven, I first heard about Hadwig and uh, John of Ruzruk in a class taught by the man who would go on to be my supervisor, Rob Fasen, and I was fascinated. From the word go, basically, as soon as I'd heard about this, it was a kind of theology or kinds of texts that I had no exposure to, and I've been really fascinated with them ever since. And so I wrote my BA paper on Marguerite Perrette, and so in a way, she was my first mystical love, and I've continued to work on her since. Then I did my MA thesis, I worked on, on uh, Ruzbruck. And then I ended up writing my doctoral dissertation about a whole series of mystics and the connections between a whole series of mystics in the 12th century, 13th century, and 14th century. Okay, so Marguerite Porette was your gateway mystic. Yes. What was it that you liked about her? I suppose what really appealed to me at that age was not so much her text, The Mirror of Simple Souls, which is an extremely complex mystical treatise. It's very difficult to understand. But what really interested me at the time was the fact that she'd been burned at stake. And I was fascinated because I just, you know, discovered mysticism. And then there was this mystic who'd been burned at stake. And I thought that that was really interesting. Latterly, I became to be much more interested in the ideas in the text rather than what happened to the historical Marguerite. And then, you know, the more you read, the more you see, yeah, the kind of the world of mystical literature and even just that very brief period of mystical literature, you know, the, the 12th century, the 13th century, the 14th century, what mystical authors are writing about, how contentious a lot of their ideas are, the more you discover, then the more you start seeing connections and, you know, differences and convergences between different mystical authors. And what I became really interested in is not only the way in which mystics articulate their theological ideas from a literary point of view, and in different genres, but also how that affects the theological ideas that they're articulating, and the way in which you can trace certain theological ideas in their development through different literary permutations. And I thought, yeah, well, and I do still think that, that that's really interesting. And so you can see, you know, even mystics writing in different languages, but in a relatively confined geographical area, the Southern Low Countries. You see that Marguerite Perrette, who originally wrote in Old French, the Old French Picard dialect, and certain 13th century Middle Dutch mystics, that there are certain terms that she translates directly into her treatise. Very unusual terms in Middle Dutch and very unusual terms in, in French. And then you could sort of see that this, you know, this kind of multilingual or interlingual network of texts and the way in which they're being transmitted and then what different people are doing with them. In addition, of course, to the you know, numerous other sources that they're using, but that's what really interests me is, is the way different mystics take and adapt and reformulate ideas from one another. And these mystical networks of authors also dealt with controversial ideas and they end up being interpreted differently as they pass through them. Absolutely. And the interesting thing is you'll have certain mystics who will say things that appear to be very, very controversial and dangerous from a perspective of doctrinal orthodoxy and who get into trouble for it and who even get burned at stake for it. Whereas other mystics will say very similar things. And because of the context in which they wrote, because of the readership, they don't get into trouble and on the contrary, they might be venerated, you know, they might be canonized, they might be beatified, when from a kind of substantial content-related theological point of view, they might actually say things that are more daring and more doctrinally shocking than, um, 
orthodox mystic. So in, in a way, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm interested in doing is sort of seeing where the boundaries get blurred between what is orthodoxy and what's acceptable in certain contexts and what isn't. And speaking of these networks and the transmissions of these ideas, listeners with keen ears and good memories may be thinking back to episode 14 when Lydia Shehan was on talking about Hadevich and mentioned Jan van Rysbroek as one of the people who used Hadevich's work and was a near contemporary of hers, utilizing the ideas that we find in her text. I mean, what Lydia said is absolutely true. So Rysbroek never mentions Hadevich by name. So he quotes her copiously, but anonymously. But Rydruk almost never mentions any of his sources. So Rydruk was the prior at a monastery in the forest outside Brussels, and the, there was a layperson and a cook called the Alvar Leeuwen, who also wrote mystical texts, and he does refer to Hadamith twice, literally, and he calls her a holy woman, whose works are on a par with St. Paul's, and perhaps even better than St. Paul's, but more difficult to understand. It's quite an extraordinary statement, but it is one of only two external references that we have to the historical figure of Hadevich about whom we otherwise know nothing. Okay, so we know very little about Hadevich, but do we know more about Rysbroek? Yes, much more. We're much better informed about Rysbroek's life because there are contemporary biographical accounts. Well, there is one contemporary biographical account, and then there is a kind of biography, hagiography. It's, mo it's more a hagiography than a biography, but it does give us really important information about his life as well that was written about 40 years after he died, but it was written by a member of this community of which he had been the prior, who did have access to people who must have known him. And so, yeah, this hagiography was relatively close to the source, uh, but there is a great deal in this hagiography that has been shown to be historically inaccurate, most probably. But yes, we're, we're much better informed about Rysbroek. He was born in 1293. We don't know exactly where he was born. He must have been born in a hamlet called Rysbroek, but there are three such hamlets around Brussels. So we don't know exactly where he was born, but he was probably born relatively close to Brussels. There is a place called Rysbroek just outside the old city walls of Brussels. And uh, we know that from a young age, he lived with his uncle. So we don't really know anything about his parents, but that he, from a young age, he lived with his uncle who lived in the center of Brussels near the collegiate church of St. Gudula, where he was a canon. And so the collegiate church of St. Gudula later became the cathedral of Brussels. So that's the big Gothic cathedral in Brussels today. But at the time, it was a collegiate church and they were actually in that period, just rebuilding what had been the Romanesque church into the massive Gothic structure that is there now. And so the next thing we really know about Rusruk is that he was ordained in 1317, and he became a chaplain at the Collegiate Church of, of St. Gudula, and that that's what he did for the next 25 years of his life. So when did he start producing his written works? Was it once he became a chaplain? He had already started writing mystical texts while he lived in Brussels, and uh, his first book, The Realm of Lovers, was finished there. But the important kind of major change in his life was in 1343. So another canon at the Collegiate Church of St. Gudula, who had close connections with the court of the Duke of Brabant, John III, he mediated for the, the Duke of Brabant to donate to these three men. So Rysbroek himself, Jan Hinkart, his uncle, who he'd lived with for many years, and then Frank van Godenberg, this other canon, the three of them were given a hermitage in the forest, in the Sonian forest, outside Brussels, with you know, the agreement with the Duke that they would go and that they would rebuild it and that they would, that they would kind of populate it as a hermitage. And what... Uh, Henrik Bomerius, the later hagiographer of Ruthruk, tells us is that Ruthruk really wanted to live a quieter life and that he had, that he had certain conflicts with other members of the clergy in Brussels and that he really is sort of, yeah, almost at the bustle of, you know, busy city life in Brussels was a distraction to the kind of silence and the kind of contemplative silence that he wanted to pursue. So these three men... Easter 1343, moved uh, down into the forest. And there, Rusruk continued to write. 
And then uh, what we're told is that Ruzbrook, he had a certain fame and that his fame was growing as a writer and as a contemplative and that that attracted other people to want to join the monastery. So Jan van Leeuwen, and I mentioned earlier, he joined only a year after they'd moved there and he became the kind of cook and general handyman in the hermitage. And other people continue to be attracted to this community. And so in 1350, there were enough of them that they weren't really a hermitage anymore and that they had to adopt some kind of official ecclesiastical status. And so they became a priory of canons regular under the rule of Augustine. And Jan von Ruzbruck became the first prior. And he remained the prior until his death in 1381. And during the rest of his life, he continued to write mystical treatises. And Ruzbruck remained the prior of this uh, monastery in Runendal until 1381. And he continued to write mystical treatises throughout those years. So he had probably written The Realm of Lovers, his first book, while he was living in Brussels. And he probably written the first part of what is now considered his masterpiece, The Spiritual Espousals, before moving to Grunendal, but he probably finished it in Grunendal. And then he went on to write nine more treatises of mystical theology of various lengths. So some of them are very short. But what was considered in the Middle Ages, his great masterpiece, The Spiritual Tabernacle, is a very, very long, complex, allegorical book. That's a lot of text. Do you have a lot of time on your hands as a prior? Is it like a really easy job? No, that's the quite remarkable thing that actually the prior, so his uncle had become the first provost of the monastery. So Ruther wasn't at the head of the monastery, but the prior, usually the responsibilities of a prior are all, you know, the kind of administrative day-to-day -day management uh, of a monastery. And so it does seem quite remarkable that he found the time to be writing these texts. Some of the stories that we're told in the hagiography are that Ruzruk would go off by himself into the forest. And so there is one anecdote that's quite sweet, really, that he'd gone out for the day to contemplate and that he hadn't come back and that the monks were concerned about him. And we have to imagine, right, that in the 14th century, we don't really think of it this way now, but in the 14th century, the city was actually safe. You know, within the city walls was a safe place to live. And if you go off and live by yourself in the forest with a relatively small group of people, it's not a safe place to live. You know, because there are wild animals, there might be brigands, there might be bandits, whatever, right? Yeah, you're under kind of constant threat. And so some of the monks were very concerned about him. And so they've gone out to look for him to see if something had happened. And they discovered him at a distance from the priory buildings under a tree inflamed in uh, the love of God. And so, the, yeah, he hadn't come back to the monastery because he had been in rapture. And so that's only one story about how, yeah, Ruzruk would go out into the forest and contemplate God. And as a result of that, would then come back and he would, there, there are almost contemporary images of Ruzruk dictating to a scribe. So he did remarkably find the time to be both a prior and prolific author. I mean, I'm jealous of his output, but also kind of annoyed about the connections between this and the writer's block advice of like, hey, you can't write your book. No problem. Go for a walk in the woods. Like, no. Um, yeah, well, uh, he was nothing, apparently, if not a multitasker. And of course, I suppose he had, you know, there were other things that contemporary academics have to deal with that he did not have to deal with. Uh, although he did also teach, we know that he, he often gave conferences for the monks in Grunendal. So he was, I guess he just managed to combine all of these things. And, you know, who knows? We don't, we, we're not told really anything about the priory administration. So maybe he just delegated all of those things to other people. So he continued living at the Priory until the end of his life? Yes, he died in Grunendal in 1381 on the 2nd of December, and he was buried in the monastery graveyard. But he was later moved by the canons into the church, as was Jan Paul Leeuwen, actually, because the two, the prior and the cook, they were both venerated for centuries afterwards by the canons of Grunendal. And in fact, until the abolition of the monastery in the 18th century. Ruzruk and Yavar Leeuwen were considered at Grunendal to be the two holiest men in the tradition of, of their monastery and the two saints of their monastery. But neither Ruzruk nor Yavar Leeuwen have actually ever officially been canonized. So in all of these various texts, are there similar themes that run throughout them? Are they all very different? 
What kinds of things is he writing about? Ruhrig is a very consistent writer. So all of these 11 texts, basically, they're all what we call mystical. They are all about ineffable union with God, the encounter with God, and the transformative union with God and its effects. So it's all about the preparation for consciousness of and the effects of being united in God, united in love with God. So some of his texts were written for specific people and intended to be a kind of spiritual guides for these people. So we're told actually by the, the contemporary account uh, of Ruthruk's life that uh, the sparkling stone, for example, was written for a hermit, another hermit who lived in the forest, who had asked Ruthruk about the spiritual life, the mystical life. But there are actually in this text still some indications. So at one point, Ruthruk gets asked a question about the highest form of contemplative union. And then he kind of goes into a, a more detailed description of that. Uh, other texts we know were written for um, a poor Claire who lived in Brussels. So he also wrote letters. There's a collection of letters. So he was in correspondence with various people as well, including some notable people like uh, the mystic Jonas Tauler, who actually visited Ruthruk in Grunendal and uh, Heer Tjurota, who is the, considered the founder of the modern devotion the movement of the modern devotion, which marked the, the spiritual landscape of the Netherlands for the whole of the 15th century, and the most important offshoot of the modern devotion, or the most important branch of the modern devotion, the, the brothers and sisters of the common life, that common life that actually comes from Ruzbrook and the, the highest mystical ideal that Ruzbrook articulates in his texts. So he was in contact with a lot of uh, notable mystical authors, and he was writing texts for specific people. He was presumably, some of the texts were also written for the canons uh, in Grunendal, uh, for the education of the, of the canons. And some of them we don't really know. So we're not entirely clear, actually. A, a lot of work has been done on it, but we're not entirely clear on the, the exact chronology of Ruth's works or on the occasion uh, for a lot of them. So who he wrote them for. And so one of his texts, one of his really short texts, The Little Book of Clarification, we know, so I've mentioned this contemporary biography of Ruzruk several times that was actually written by the procurator of the Charter House of Herne, which is about 40 kilometers from Grunendal. And we know that his first text, The Realm of Lovers, they had somehow gotten a copy of this book and they were perplexed, he writes, about certain statements in it. So they were basically concerned about its orthodoxy. They didn't really understand what Ruzruk meant in describing the highest form of mystical union with God. And so they invited him to Herna, to their charter house, to kind of explain it to them. And he, you know, he was already a, a relatively old man at the time, but he went on foot to Herna and he stayed with them for a few days. And he explained his mystical theology to them. And then he wrote this little book of clarification for them. So we do know why he wrote that text in which he gives a brief summary of his whole mystical theology. But the interesting thing is that in this biography, Gerard of Saints, this uh, procurator of the Charterhouse, he says that Ruzruk was surprised that they'd gotten hold of a copy of The Realm of Lovers because he hadn't intended it to be for circulation. Even though he thought it was a generally sound book, he didn't actually intend for it to be copied and circulated. So what about the messages of these works? Are those consistent or does he change the topic based on who might be reading it? The basic structure of his thought remains the same throughout all of these books. And so they are all about minna, which is the Middle Dutch term for love. And the term minna, I suppose, like the English term love, is a very kind of polyvalent term. You know, like in Latin and in Latin theological texts, you get these distinctions between amor and delectio and caritas, never very consistent distinctions across different authors, but there are lots of different words to talk about different kinds of love. whereas in Middle Dutch, you really only have Mina. And so Mina can be about the love that you have for God. It can be about the love that God has for you. It can be about the love that you have for other people or the rest of creation. But it can also be a kind of proper name for God and for the Trinity because God is love. And so Mina is often used simply as a proper name for God. But Mina can also refer to the Holy Spirit specifically as the love of God. And all of Ruzruk's texts are about that. The minna that God is, the minna that God has for the world, and the stages of spiritual ascent uh, through which people go to encounter God, be united with God, be transformed by God, and then ultimately to manifest 
the love of God in the world, in the kind of concrete, factual reality of their daily lives. And so Rudolf articulates in most of his texts, you know, he makes distinctions between the way in which all people are united with God through an intermediary. He sometimes also calls that the active life. So that's kind of, you know, the first stage which you find in many spiritual writers, the first stage of getting your moral house in order, in order to prepare yourself to encounter God. And he likens those to servants in some of his texts. So, you know, there's what Marguerite Perret would call the merchants of the spiritual life. They're, for them, their relationship with God is uh, based on a kind of principle of, of economic exchange. So they will only live virtuously because they think that God will reward them for it somehow, or because they're afraid that they will be punished if they don't. But it's always a kind of self-interested, self-motivated reason to live virtuously. And that's the kind of the most basic level on which good people do good things. Then the second step, you could say, is the interior life. And there, it's still self-instigated, the love for God, but it's of a, of a kind of higher order. So Ruth talks about, you know, the way in which human beings deploy their higher faculties of memory, intellect, and will, and they are more inwardly oriented to God. He calls these people friends of God. Right, So it's no longer about bartering. They really genuinely want to practice love simply for love's sake, and they want to be you know, good people simply for the sake of being good people, not because they think they're going to gain some advantage by it or avoid some kind of a disadvantage by it. And then he has this third level, which he calls the contemplative life. That is when people are actually completely annihilated, you know, annihilated from all self-consciousness in God. So he describes using all kinds of spatial metaphors and other metaphors being drawn up into God and completely united with God so that you can no longer discern any distinction between yourself and God. And then there is a fourth level. And so very often in mystical texts, that's where it ends, right? That there is, you know, you have this union with intermediary. So through the sacraments or the works of charity or whatever it might be, you have the union without intermediary, which is a kind of interior life oriented to God. And then this third level of union without difference or distinction, where the human soul is so united with the Godhead that there is no difference or distinction anymore between the two. But then Ruzruk has this fourth step, which he calls the common life. And that is actually the kind of harmonious integration and combination of the active life, the interior life, and the contemplative life. And that is when the human person returns to the world, as it were, but returns to the world completely transfigured, and now no longer loves in the world uh, in any kind of self-motivated way, or even with their own love, because their love has been so united and annihilated in God, that they actually love in the world the way God loves in the world. So they become a kind of transparency, this common person. You know, they have contemplation and action in common, but they are common to all, and they are also in common with God. And so they become a kind of transparency for the love of God, which they manifest in the factual reality of their, of their daily life. And that's really one of the kind of cornerstones, the hallmarks of Ruzruk's mystical theology and of the whole structure of his thought is that, you know, things don't just end when it comes to the mystical life, when it comes to union with God. It isn't just, okay, now I'm united with God. That's the end of the story. It does have an effect in your concrete life. And speaking of lives, let's talk a little bit more about Ruzruk's own experiences you mentioned that he was recorded as, you know, burning under a tree at one point. Do we know much about his own mystical experiences? From a biographical point of view, there is nothing. So Ruzruk never writes uh, biographically. He never writes about himself. He only writes about the stages of progress and transformation of the soul, but he never actually talks about himself. So all of the stories that we have of the miracles that he performed from when he was a very young age, of uh, the ecstatic experiences that he had, they all come from this later hagiography that was written 40 years after he died. The contemporary biography by this uh, Carl Fusion that I mentioned doesn't have anything really like that. That simply says that the Ruzruk's texts are sound and orthodox, 
and reading them could bring somebody to a perfect life if they really, you know, if they read them and kind of integrated them really into their lives. He writes that he wrote his texts because he thought there was a need for sound doctrine in that period because of some erroneous teachings that had been spreading about, and particularly that there was a need for sound doctrine in the vernacular. So that's why he wrote all of his texts in Middle Dutch. But Ruzuk never really writes anything about himself. The problem, of course, with mystical texts is that, and what Ruzuk says many times, is that you know, being united with God in the contemplative life is not something that you can ever produce on your own initiative. It is a kind of the free gift of God. So the most that you can do is prepare yourself, both in terms of your active life and your inner life, to be oriented to God and to be oriented to the selfless practice of love. But actually being united with God is something that only God can do. So, you know, it's, it's the, basically the infusion of the Holy Spirit, either to talk about it in special metaphors, again, the descent of the Holy Spirit or God drawing you up into the life of God. That's not something human beings can do. And he says the only way that you can know that is by experience. So then you would conclude that, okay, if Ruthrup is writing all of these books about this, and he says you can only know this by experience and no one can teach the contemplative life, then he must have been a contemplative. But he never actually makes that connection. He never says, and you know, and this is what I experienced. He just describes it. So the fact that he seems to know what he's talking about suggests that he must have experienced this in some way, but he never tells us about that. You mentioned that there were some bad heretical ideas circulating about at this time. Is that something that Ruzbrook ends up getting caught up in, or is his work accepted as legitimate and orthodox with no question? So we know, again, from Jan van Leeuwen, what Jan van Leeuwen writes about Ruzbrook is that Ruzbrook was attacked during his lifetime for writing mystical heresy. So there are some places in Ruthbrook's works where he becomes very kind of condemnatory and very moralizing about mystical heretics. And on the basis of those passages and some things that Bormirius, his hagiographer, writes, Ruthbrook has sometimes been presented as a kind of heresy hunter even though he doesn't really present himself that way in his texts. And actually, what seems to be going on more often in his texts is that he's kind of defending himself against any possible accusation, because he had had this experience, according to Yavar Leon anyway. And so I think that his repeated emphasis on the orthodoxy of his teaching is only to kind of avoid being attacked for being a mystical heretic. We don't know if he knew about the condemnation of Marguerite Perret. And we don't know if he knew that she was burned at stake. So he would have been 17 at the time. We don't know how widely that story was known, was talked about. He never mentions it. Nobody else, as far as we know, ever mentions her. But he does talk about the heresy of the free spirit. And the heresy of the free spirit is something with which she is very often associated. So it's not impossible that he would have known about her condemnation and, and the fact that she was burned at the stake. We do know, certainly, that he was aware of Meister Eckhart and that he was aware of the condemnation of Meister Eckhart. Not, again, because he ever mentions Meister Eckhart, but because Jan van Leeuwen does. And Jan van Leeuwen actually wrote a treatise on the erroneous teachings of Meister Eckhart. So Eckhart was known in Grunenwell, though Ruzruk never mentions him. We don't know how many of Eckhart's works were known in Grunenwell, but they must have known in Grunenwell that the bull in Agro Dominico had condemned some statements from the works of Eckhart. And so I think, yeah, when Yavar Levin defends his orthodoxy and when he emphasizes the orthodoxy of his own teaching, it's really as a kind of preemptive defense against any possible accusations of heresy. And then later on in the hagiography, there is this story about how Ruzbruck wrote his works against this woman called Blumardina, Helwig Blumart, this woman in Brussels who was apparently a heretic of the free spirit. And that Ruzruk was actually, you know, his works were primarily intended as a, to kind of combat her heresy. And this is the person to whom the Gerard, the Carthusian, was also referring to obliquely when he says, yeah, some erroneous doctrines had sprung up. And so there was a need for this sound doctrine in the vernacular. So Mirius the Hagiographer identifies this person as Blumardina, but that all actually seems to be part of a propaganda campaign to defend Ruzruk and to kind of portray Ruzruk as a kind of heresy hunter. Because everything that we know about this Blumardina is that she was actually a very highly regarded 
wealthy woman who lived in Brussels who founded a, a home for the city's elderly poor and for whom there was a commemorative mass was celebrated every year, at least until the 16th century. So this whole story and this whole kind of portrayal of Hrushrup as a heresy hunter, is just a kind of fiction. And, and I think part of a propaganda campaign to defend him, because he was also posthumously condemned by the Chancellor of the University of Paris. So that's another long story in which one of Hrushrup's works, The Spiritual Espousals, which is considered one of his masterpieces that had been translated into Latin, and it was then sent to Jean Gerson, the Chancellor of the University of Paris, who wrote a very condemnatory letter in response to it, saying that the first two books of the Spiritual Espousal, so it's a work in three parts, and that the first two parts were orthodox and were okay, but that the third book should be completely expunged and should be burned because that was just heretical. And then you see in Grunendal that there is this defense of Ruzvruch, including by one canon, Jan Stornhofen, who had known him, writing these defenses of Ruzvruch to say, no, 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 even the third part of the spiritual spouses is completely orthodox, completely sound, but we only have sort of little, these little elements, you know, here and there to be able to reconstruct this picture of how Ruzvruch saw himself as a spiritual writer, we have very little to go on in terms of how he understood whatever contemplative experience or contemplative consciousness he himself may have had, because, of course, it's very dangerous to kind of to assume that everything he writes is something that he experienced himself, because he doesn't say that. And also what his place was with respect to people who were attacking him during his life, you know, and then the culmination of that comes after he died. Fortunately, he, he had already died because he might have been tried for heresy himself if he'd still been alive when his texts had been translated into Latin and circulated amongst the kind of, you know, the scholastic intellectual elite. So what we're learning is John loves a heretic. Yeah, I've always, I don't know why, but I've always been partial to the underdog. I mean, of course you are. Who isn't? They're the ones worth fighting for. Now back to Roosbrook and his text... Is there a particular passage or a moment in the text that you really enjoy? I know with so many works, it might be a little bit difficult to pick, but I'm going to make you do it anyway. Is there something that comes to mind? My favorite of his books is actually The Sparkling Stone, which, as I mentioned, was written for an anonymous hermit. We don't know who this person was, who lived in the forest in Brussels. And because, yeah, there are certain metaphors that he uses there, there are certain he just expresses himself particularly beautifully, I think, in that book. I mean, there are many, many parts of Ruzluk's works that are brilliant, far, far too many to, to talk about here. But there are two particular passages, one from The Spiritual Spousals and one from The Sparkling Stone, that are two of my favorites. The first, from The Spiritual Spousals, he's talking about the storm of love. And yeah, the Urugut in Middle Dutch, that's something actually that probably got from Hadwig, because uh, she writes about that as well. And it's about the encounter between the human spirit and the divine spirit. And so he writes, In this storm of love, two spirits contend, the spirit of God and our spirit. God, through the Holy Spirit, inclines himself towards us, and thereby we are touched in love. And by God's operation and the faculty of loving, our spirit presses itself and inclines itself towards God, and thereby God is touched. From these two there arises the strife of love. In the depths of the encounter, in that innermost and most intense visit, each spirit is wounded the most by love. These two spirits, that is, our spirit and God's spirit, flash and shine into each other, and each shows the other its face. This makes each spirit continually crave for the other with love. Each exacts of the other that which he is, and each offers and invites the other to that which he is. And this makes the lovers flow away into each other. God's touch and his gifts, our loving craving and our giving in return, keep love steadfast. This flowing out and flowing back cause the fountain of love to overflow. Thus God's touch and our love's craving become one single love. Here a person is so possessed by love they must forget themselves and God, and they know nothing but love. Thus the spirit is burned up in the fire of love. That is a kind of description, right, of the meeting of the human spirit and the divine spirit and the, the effect that this has on each of them. And that's a really 
kind of classic expression of the fact that this union, in this union without difference or, or distinction, the human person kind of loses all self-consciousness. Rousseau uses kind of absorption language and this kind of melding language, even though he always emphasizes that a creature is a creature and the creator is the creator and the creature never becomes the creator. But in love, they can become so united with one another that no distinction can really be felt anymore. Or that, well, one forgets oneself and one even forgets God because there is only love left over. That's a powerful act of forgetting. But you mentioned this earlier. This isn't where it ends for Rosebrook. There is an additional step of this returning to the world. Yeah. So what I find really interesting about it is that it's not only a question of personal experience, right? It's never privatized. It has a kind of universal effect in the sense that it's never just about one's own private spiritual self-gratification and union with God. It's really about what are the effects of encountering God on one's life and the way one kind of lives in the world. And at the very, very end of The Sparking Stone, he writes, and this is another of my favorite passages about this sort of final integration of the act of the inner and the contemplative lives. And he says, person who is sent by God down from these heights, that is the heights of contemplation, into the world is full of truth and rich in all virtue. And he seeks nothing for himself, but only the honor of the one who sent him. And therefore he is just and true in all his actions. And he has a rich, mild foundation, which is grounded in the wealth of God. And therefore he must always flow into all those who need him. For the living fountain of the Holy Spirit is his wealth, which cannot be exhausted. And he's a living, willing instrument of God with which God does what he wants, the way he wants. And he doesn't claim this for himself, but gives the honor to God. And therefore he remains willing and ready to do all that God commands and strong and courageous to suffer and bear all that God allows to befall him. And therefore he has a common life for contemplation and action come just as readily to him and he's perfect in both. And in a way, you could say that he emphasizes this so strongly because, you know, he does seem to have this idea of free spirit is quite kind of quietest tendencies on the background while he's writing that, you know, mysticism is not just about coming to complete stillness in God. It is also about being as active as God is. So what kind of impact and influence did Roosbrook's works have during his life? As you mentioned, some of them weren't meant for circulation. So how far did they spread? Well, Roosbrook is often described as the most important mystic in the Middle Dutch tradition. So nowadays, probably in the English-speaking world, Hadewig might be better known than Roosbrook is. And Hadewig is not detract at all from anything, that, you know, from Hadewig at all, because Hadewig is also a brilliant writer. There are very few manuscripts of Hadewig's works, which implies that Hadewig was actually not well known at all. And she was never translated, or at least not, you know, comprehensively into any other language. So Hadewig had a very, very limited reception. But it's actually through Ruzbruck in a way that anonymously a lot of Hadewig's ideas got a much wider reception and a much wider circulation. Because even during his life, many of Ruzbruck's texts were translated into Latin and they were translated and are still today being translated into many other different languages. In fact, it's been suggested, it's been estimated that Ruzbruck is the second most translated Dutch author after Anne Frank. So he did have, and he does continue to have, quite a wide reception. That's very impressive. Now, John, we are coming to the end of the podcast, which means I have to ask you the one final question, which is, why is Roosbrook your favorite mystic? So I knew that this question was coming, so I tried to prepare for it. And actually, I have to say that it's very, very difficult to say that he is really my favorite mystic, because... There are other mystical writers of whom I can say unquestionably that they're not my favorite mystic. But there are a few who, when I think about them, who could fall into that category. So Marguerite Perret is one, Yavar Lewin is another. The reason that Yavar Ruzbrook is also one of my favorites is because I find his texts really endlessly fascinating and inspiring. He's not often considered a beautiful writer, especially when compared to Hadley, and I would agree with that view. Hadwig is a far more beautiful writer than Ruzbrook, but there are certain passages 
of immense beauty and great insight, I think. And so Ruzrug, even though he's writing in the 14th century, there are all kinds of moments of incredible psychological insight and just the kind of nuance and refinement of his theological vision is really staggering. So in that sense, of all the mystical writers that I know, he is really one of my favorites. Um, and what I think is really startling and remarkable about it is that you get this theological synthesis. So it's as though he has read incredibly widely and he's taken all of the best parts of all of the people that he's read and he's sort of like brought them together in his own extraordinary synthesis of mystical theology. That is amazing. John, thank you so much for joining me today and for telling me all about Jan van Roosbroek. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And I really, I'm, I'm a big fan of the podcast. So I hope it goes on for a long time. Thank you so much. That's very kind. And it was an absolute pleasure. And thank you all so much for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at MyFaveMystic. And join me next time for a very special episode where I'm going to be talking about my favorite mystic, Agnes Blanbegin.